Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the committee's 33rd meeting in 2020. Could I ask everyone please to make sure their mobile phones are on silent? The meeting will be conducted in a hybrid format with some of our members participating remotely. Apologies have been received from Oliver Mundell, and Jamie Halcrow Johnson is attending as a committee substitute. The first item on the agenda is subordinate legislation, and this is to consider one affirmative instrument as detailed on the agenda. The committee will take evidence on the island community's impact assessments publication review of decisions Scotland regulations 2020. The motion seeking the approval of the affirmative instrument will be considered at item uh, two. Members should note there have been no representations to the committee on this instrument. And before I welcome members of the Scottish Government uh, to this meeting, I'd like to ask if there are any members who would like to make a declaration of interest. And I think, Angus MacDonald, you would like to make a declaration of interest, followed by Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Angus, good morning. Uh, thank you, convener, and uh, good morning. Um, given today's agenda, uh, particularly items one, two, and, and part of four, um, I'm obliged to declare that I own a, a private residence and two non-domestic properties in the Western Isles, uh, from which I derive no income. Thank you, for, thank you for that, Angus. Uh, and Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much, convener, and just the same in that uh, I am a partner in a agricultural business. Uh, in Orkney and own property uh, in the islands. Okay, Th thank you for that. Uh, and I'd now like to welcome uh, a panel from the Scottish Government. First of all, I'd like to welcome Paul Wheelhouse, the Minister for Energy, Connectivity and the Islands. I'd like to welcome Erica, Erica Clarkson, the Head of Islands and Rural Communities Directorate for Agriculture and the Rural Economy. Uh, Paul Maxton, the Islands Community Impact Assessments Lead Directorate for Agriculture and the Rural Economy, and Jill Turnbull, the Legal Directorate for the Scottish Government. Minister, would you like to make a brief opening statement? I'm not muted. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Convener. And I'm pleased to be here today in consideration of the Draft Islands Community Impact Assessment uh, publication and review of decisions Scotland Regulations 2020. Um, the draft regulations make provision under Section 9, Subsection 1 of the Islands Scotland Act 2018 about reviews of decisions of relevant authorities relating to island community impact assessments under Section 8, Subsection 1 of the Act. They also introduce a requirement for publication of island communities uh, impact assessments by relevant authorities under Section 30, Subsection 1 of the Act. Separately, the Islands uh, Scotland Act 2018 Commencement No. 3 Regulations 2020 will bring into force sections 7 to 10, 11 subsection 1 and 12 to 14 of the Islands Scotland Act 2018. Commencement regulations are not subject to parliamentary procedure and not being considered by committee today. Um, section 9, subsection 2 of the Act sets out the specific features that may be included in the review provisions. If approved, uh, these regulations will create provision for reviews that satisfies the requirements of the Act. Uh, the regulations are innovative, as no other Scottish Government impact assessment process, for example, Equalities Impact Assessments, has a review procedure. Uh, and the Committee will uh, be familiar with the Island Scotland Act 2018, which introduced the public sector duty requiring listed relevant authorities to prepare an island's community impact assessment in relation to a policy, strategy or service which, in the authorities' opinion, is likely to have an effect on an island community which is significantly different uh, from its effect on other communities, including other island communities, in the area in which the authority exercises its functions. As indicated, the commencement regulations will bring this duty into force. Uh, it is worth noting that, in the absence of the Section 8, Subsection 1 duty being in force, it has been the expectation that, where possible, the Scottish Government should be operating in the spirit of the Act into account when developing or reviewing policies, strategies or services. These regulations will empower island communities to enable them to seek a review of decisions made by relevant authorities in respect of island's community impact assessments. The uh, regulations provide a robust and proportionate framework for the review of decisions relating to island communities' impact assessments based on uh, transparency and accountability. 
And finally, uh, convener, the, the Act makes no provision for guidance to accompany the regulations. However, we would intend uh, to monitor through our island stakeholders whether guidance would be beneficial. And I hope that the committee will recommend that the draft regulations be approved. Thank you very much, convener. Thank you very much, Minister. And I'm now looking uh, to members if there's anyone that would like to ask any questions. Um, Jamie, I think you want to ask questions. Start with Jamie. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Minister. Um, I just had a question. I just had a question in regards to the kind of technical aspects of the bill. There are a large number of public public bodies that have to um, uh, do an island's impact assessment, and at the moment, my understanding is that the requirement is only that they. Uh, publish uh, the details on their website in terms of uh, when they're undertaking a review, um, the deadlines process. Um, I just wondered, I mean, obviously that's, a, that's harder for perhaps those on the islands that want to keep in touch with uh, impact assessments, um, which may be relevant to them if they've got to check all these different websites. So I was wondering whether it might be possible for ministers to be advised and then there to be some sort of dash, central dashboard on the Scottish Government website which um, would allow somebody that is interested uh, in keeping an eye on um, what uh, impact assessments, island impact assessments are being undertaken to be able to go to one central resource to do that. So, I mean, if you could confirm that isn't available at the moment and if it isn't, whether it be something that could be considered. Minister. Well, I, th I should thank um, Jamie Huckle Johnson for what is a very uh, useful question and um, clearly uh, there are provisions uh, within the, the, the Act and regulations um, to, um, to cover the issue of publication, and I certainly identify what he is saying, not least because we obviously want to avoid uh, duplicate requests. If there's already a request in which uh, fulfils the, the interests of a potential um, uh, person that wishes to request a review, then they can see that on. If it, if it is published, they can see that one is already in the system and perhaps support that application rather than uh, create their own. Uh, previously, in, in terms of the Act, uh, a relevant authority was only obliged to publish its reasons for not carrying out an island's community impact assessment, but now all island community uh, impact assessments are to be published in the interest of transparency, and the provision is being introduced um, as a supplementary provision considered uh, appropriate for the purpose of giving full effect to the Act. It will now uh, hopefully allow the public uh, access to decision-making on whether an ICIA has already been carried out or not. Um, and in terms of what we expect the relevant authorities to publish on their websites, the process has been developed so over it's transparent, will give confidence in the process, and we require them to publish the application form, any third party representations following publication, responses to uh, those third party representations, and any written submissions requested by the relevant authority and any decision notice. Um, but you, you make a good point and, and, uh, around having a central place in which you know, it would be possible for anyone to see what's been published by any authority because it could um, it could be helpful uh, to, to to the potential applicant. I may uh, just ask um, in terms of that that provision uh, Paul Maxton can you know just to say what our thoughts are around uh, trying to collate all of these um, these reports into one place with your forbearance convener. Paul. Good morning Paul are you there? Paul, I think you're live now. Hello? Off you go. Yep, off you go, Paul. Thank you, convener. Sorry. Um, yes, in terms of the regulations, the um, obligation is to, to publish the the ICIA, etc. Um, you know, the relevant authority can use its own website. Um, I think whether um, it uses Another website would really be a matter, perhaps for itself. It's something we can certainly look at. Um, you know, going forward, I think um, we have, um, you know, as part of the post implementation, you know, and the monitoring, review, reviewing of the process. I don't know that we'll, we'll, we'll have a lot to learn. We can certainly see the, the benefit of. Of having one central um, repository, as it were, um, but that, that's that's maybe something we, we can we can look at further, um, you know, in conjunction with um, our, our stakeholders. 
Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you for being on. Uh, are there any other questions? Um, okay, uh, if there are no other questions, uh, we're going to move on to agenda item two. And this is the formal consideration of motion S5M 23257 in the name of the Minister for Energy, Connectivity and the Islands, calling on the committee to recommend that the island community's impact assessment, publication and review of decisions Scotland Regulations 2020 draft be approved. Minister, can I ask you um, to move the motion and uh, are there any comments that you would wish to make, uh, further comments you'd wish to make? Um, in, in formally moving, uh, convener, if I can just uh, agree with the point that Paul uh, Maxton made just, just previously there, that uh, we're happy to look at any anything we can do to make the process of um, understanding what reviews have taken place, what Ireland's community impacts have taken place as easy as possible for stakeholders to follow. So certainly pick that point up that Mr. Halco Johnson has raised. But uh, if I can formally move, convener, thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Minister. I think Angus, you wanted to come in at this stage with with a principal <coughs> question, Angus. Uh, thanks, um, convener. Just a, a comment, really, rather than a question. Um, I, I think uh, this affirmative instrument strengthens the act and. I particularly welcome the requirement for island community impact assessments to be published online in the interests of transparency. It's definitely a positive step forward. And I welcome the comments regarding uh, possibly collating the reports in, in one place. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angus. Uh, are there any other comments? As there don't appear to me, uh, any other comments? The question is that motion S5M 23257 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We, we are agreed. Uh, and that concludes our uh, consideration of this item. I therefore uh, thank you, Minister, and your team. I'd like to move on to agenda item three, thank which you. is the European Union. Uh, withdrawal Act 2018. This is the sift of one Brexit-related SI as detailed on the agenda. The Scottish Government has allocated the negative procedure to this SSI. Is the committee agreed that it is content with the parliamentary procedure allocated to this instrument by the Scottish Government? We are content, therefore we'll move on to agenda item four, which is the consideration of subordinate legislation, two negative and one laid only instruments as detailed on the agenda. Now the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered the two negative instruments and no issues were raised. No motions to annul have been received in relation to these instrument and does any of the members therefore have any comments that they wish to make on these uh, instruments? Uh, I am therefore don't see any comments. I propose, therefore, the committee does not make any recommendations in relation to these instruments. Does any member disagree with that? No, that's agreed. Therefore, uh, the laid only instrument, which is the Island Scotland Act 2018 Commencement Number 3 Regulations 2020, was included on the agenda for the committee to note only. And given that another affirmative instrument related to the Act was also being considered at this meeting, is the committee therefore content to note that this laid only instrument, which commences certain sections of the Act, bringing them into force on the 23rd of December 2020? Are we all happy? We are, therefore, that is agreed. Now, um, I'm looking to see whether we should have a brief pause or whether we're... We are, I think, ready to move straight on to agenda item five, which is uh, women in agriculture. And the committee will take evidence from the representatives of the Women in Agriculture Task Force. This will focus on the Task Force Women in Agriculture report recommendations and the reasoning behind them. The committee today will take evidence from Sarah Jane Lang, the Chief Executive of Scottish Land and Estates, Professor Sally Shortall, the Duke of Northumberland's Chair of Rural Economy, New, uh, Newcastle University, and Anne Ray MacDonald, partner of an arable farming business in Easter Ross and the Director of Highland Business Service Cooperative. Now, I believe that one member of the panel has been uh, allocated a three-minute opening statement. I'm not sure who that is. Um, 
but we're about to find out. So welcome, and whoever's going to do the opening uh, statement, uh, please head off. If you all look the other way, of course, I can go straight into the questions. I think it's Thank Sarah, much, Sarah Jane Lang. You're off. Thank you, Convener and Committee. Thank you so much for asking us to come along today and talk about the work of the task force. Um, as the committee will be aware, the Scottish Government commissioned the Women in Farming and Agricultural Sector Research Report, which was published by Professor Shorthall and colleagues back in June 2017. That research um, established a baseline position in women in farming um, and identified a number of key barriers to women's progression in our sector. The First Minister then announced the establishment of a task force and committed the Scottish Government to taking forward the recommendations which would then be um, forthcoming. The three of us here today um, represent the different elements of the task force, which included representatives from industry organisations, academic institutions with specialism in the rural economy, and men and women working in farming businesses. Our remit was to tackle gender equality in Scottish agriculture and identify a number of actions to ensure the full potential of women in farming is realised. We see this as a positive for the entire industry, giving women equal opportunities, but in doing so, improving the economic resilience of farming and crofting businesses and securing a strong future for the whole sector. We sought to make recommendations that would deliver solutions that were practical, effective and future-proof, particularly given the changes that were coming in relation to Brexit. We also wanted to make sure that we had a number of short-term solutions, as well as looking at the longer-term um, widespread cultural change, which was clearly required. For two years, we met every couple of months to discuss and form our recommendations. We consulted with others, and we also were involved in events such as the Women in Agriculture Breakfast at the Royal Highland Show. We published our final report in 2019, and these key findings um, were structured around eight key themes. Leadership, the Equality Charter for Scottish Agriculture, training, childcare and rural areas, succession, new entrants, health and safety and crofting. It was very wide ranging. Well, when, we, when we were making our recommendations, we knew that culture change within Scottish agriculture would take time. However, we also knew that much could be done to support that change, not only by the government, but also by industry bodies and by Scottish farmers and crofters within their own families and communities. Although the remit of the task force did not extend to implementation or review of progress of the recommendations, we as task, um, task force members have asked the Scottish Government to arrange a one-year review meeting. This will take place in January. As with many things, COVID-19 has undoubtedly had an impact on progress in certain areas, and some activities, such as the Be Your Best Self training, will move online to accommodate the needs um, of the industry. Sally, Anne and I look forward to answering your questions. On behalf of the task force, I'd like to thank the committee for your continued interest in our work. Thank you, convener. Um, th thank you very much, Sir Jane. <clears throat> and I, I was just contemplating whether, at the outset, I've made a mistake by not declaring an interest in agriculture. And I am going to declare an interest in agriculture in that <clears throat> I have a part of a farming partnership that very much includes my wife uh, in, in Murray. Uh, I think Peter would like to make a declaration. Jamie Halker Johnson would like to make a declaration. Mm -hmm. And also, I suspect Stuart Stevenson would like to make a declaration. So I'm afraid before we go into the questions, which there are quite a few, uh, I'm going to turn to Peter. Thank you, Convener. And I do, do uh, want to make a, a declaration of interest as a member of a partnership. Uh, farming partnership, and uh, my daughter-in-law is a very important part of that partnership. I would, I would like to add. So uh, we're well signed up to the women in agriculture theme. And ja Jamie, and then Stuart. Uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, just, just to reiterate that I'm a member of, uh, I'm a partner in a farming business in Orkney, and a member of a number of organisations, including Scottish Land and Estates. And Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Convener. I, jointly with my uh, wife, uh, own a very small registered agricultural holding from which neither of us derive any income. Thank you, Stuart. And we'll then head off down the questions, of which there's quite a few. Um, and uh, I will, if any particular member of the uh, panel wants to come in, if you just notify the clerks, as, as I think you've been 
told how to do. So the first question comes from Stuart Stevenson. And Stuart, if you have a particular person, as any committee member does, uh, that you'd like to answer the questions, please indicate them and we'll go to them first. So Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. And in the first instance, I want to direct my question to uh, uh, Anne Ray MacDonald, um, quite arbitrarily in a way. But uh, the, 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 I, I heard uh, from uh, uh, from Sarah Jane that there's going to be a one-year review uh, in January, and that that that's to be welcomed. Uh, but it would be useful to hear, and I'm going to Anne Ray simply because you me. At the course on that uh, farmer, uh, whether uh, she can report any changes that have taken place in the year uh, since the report uh, was published. Okay. Thank you. Can you can you hear me? Absolutely. Yep. Um, thank, thank you, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Yes, obviously, um, as Sarah Jane has, has mentioned, um, we are not responsible for the implementation or we haven't been managing the implementation. But um, certainly from uh, the grassroots level, there has been a huge uh, increase in the awareness of the issue. Um, we've had um, I mean, a, a number of high profile women, obviously, um, coming to the fore in the form of Manette Batters. We've got Kate Rowell, um, who's now leading Quality Meat Scotland. So this has all helped to shine a light on the issue. And um, as I say, um, act, as, act as really good role models. Um, there's been um, the uh, Farm and Advisory um, Service has been producing some very good uh, women-only courses, started off as a pilot in 2018. And these have been heavily subscribed and very successful. Uh, the Crofting Federation has also had a number of uh, women-only courses, and again, very well attended, and feedback has been very positive. Um, in addition to that, um, the Women in Scotland, um, Women in Agriculture Scotland Goga Burn Group, headed up by June Geyer, recently had their AGM just last month, um, and uh, which was attended by over 500 um, attendees, and have been um, themselves running a number of training opportunities. Um, I think as well um, something that's that's probably worked in in the favour of a lot of women um, a silver lining to a cloud, if you may, in terms of COVID and a lot of training uh, and events, obviously having to be done by virtual means. Um, I think has actually made made a lot of these meetings and conferences a lot more accessible uh, for for women who you know may well be restricted due to caring responsibilities or ability to get away from the farm or the croft um, and not just the logistics but I think actually it can be a lot less intimidating uh, joining something online, uh, accessing various training events rather than, you know, walking into a room where perhaps the majority of attendees are, are, are male. Um, so I, I think there has been, uh, I think there has been a, a number of uh, um, in, improvements and in, in general awareness. Uh, which is giving us a real step forward over the year, despite the fact that um, obviously COVID has uh, has prevented us progressing as, as quickly as we would like in certain instances. I don't know if Sarah Jane or Sally have anything extra to add to that. Um, I, I, I wonder before, before we go to uh, other, other participants, um, can it... it Sorry, do forgive me. Um, that uh, I, I welcome the references to women, and I, I was going to ask about that. And perhaps I will, if I may, uh, move on to Professor Shawcroft and ask about the Women in Agriculture Development Programme and uh, whether that's uh, 
uh, been sufficient to do what it should have done over the last year, and uh, whether in general there's tangible progress after a year. Uh, thus joining my two questions together uh, for the professor, if I may, Kim Luna. Um, absolutely. Sally, do you want to come back on that, and then I'll try and bring yeah. you in as well, Sarah-Jane, if I may. Thank you. And can you all hear me? Fine. Yeah. Can everybody hear me? Great. Yeah. And yeah, thank you for your question. So uh, what I find really interesting about uh, how Scotland has progressed this is that following on from the research, the, you know, the, the government has taken this very seriously. They established a, a task force to look at the recommendation and, and see how best to implement it. Which ones they didn't necessarily think were the best way to go forward. It was very much a team collaborative effort. And as both Sarah Jane and Anne have said, we worked very intensely and very hard on that. But I think, but you know, and I have done quite a lot of research for different places on the whole question of gender and agriculture. But the Scottish government has committed real resources. They're taking a multi-pronged approach to trying to address that, uh, this. So they're looking at, you know, providing women with skills, addressing questions of unconscious bias. For parts of the research, we interviewed quite a lot of men on farms as well, who I think, like all of you, would very much appreciate the importance of the role of their partners to the business, but maybe then don't see the lack of women more generally in the, the farming industry. And that's, you know, another element that the task force recommended that the government should work on through the programme. So obviously, I mean, the task force was independent and made recommendations on what should be progressed. But I think really how far that has progressed is a question for the civil service and not really one for the task force, because that was not our responsibility. Thank you, uh, Sally. Uh, Sarah Jane, do you want to come in on that? Uh, can I just can, yes. I, can can I specifically just extend the question very slightly because we've had very good news from the first two. If Sarah Jane could tell us of any gaps that there are in the first year's activity, I think that would, would help us focus on how we can improve things if I may convene. And then when she's finished, I finished as well. Thank you, Kimbin. Okay, Sarah Jane, you get to give us the bad news, but you can give us some good news as well if you like. Thank you, convener. I was going to ask you to indulge me with a bit of good news first. Um, I think there's a couple of things, one of which probably isn't in our recommendation report, but which has happened, and that's been the mainstreaming of farming, especially women in farming, into the kind of wider gender equality, because the farming sector was quite separate from the women in business initiatives and other things which are happening, but those have now been mainstreamed and women in farming can access that support. Um, the organisational um, change hasn't happened as quick, I think, um, convener, and, and I think we should um, acknowledge that. Although there has been the unconscious bias training pilot and the quality charter for Scottish agriculture um, pilots carried out, we hope to be further on than we were at this stage. But quite a lot of the work involved in that hasn't been as easy remotely um, as it would be in terms of kind of face-to-face -face discussions and bringing people together, because it's all about culture change and establish, um, you know, establishing relationships, creating new um, opportunities. But there has been, you know, even though we're not as far on as we wanted to be, there has been progress. And Sally, um, Anne mentioned um, earlier the impact of COVID and the, the silver lining. Certainly, at Scottish land and estates, we've seen a huge um, increase in diversity. Or not just of gender, but in age, geography and, and knowledge, attending events, putting themselves forward for committees, um, a pipeline for board members that we've certainly never had um, previously, and a large proportion of, of those, I'm glad to say, are, are women. So we're see we are seeing a big change, even though we're not as far forward with especially the Equality Charter as we'd hoped to be. Stuart, is, uh, have you a follow-up, or are you happy with that? Well, uh, thank, thank, you, thank, you, thank you, Stuart. We'll move on to the next lot of questions, which come from, I think, Richard Lyle. Good morning, Richard. Good morning, convener. Uh, good morning, panel. Scotland is likely to have a new agricultural policy to replace the cap in the next few years. What policy changes would support the task force 
recommendations in this in this context. And my question is, uh, firstly, is to Anne Ray McDonald. Anne. Um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Yes, a complex area. I think um, it's well recognised that uh, a lot of women um, in farming family partnerships in particular um, are very involved in a number of diversification enterprises um, and uh, also very heavily involved in kind of business planning and finance. Um, so my mind, anything that helps further support uh, diversification, which is without doubt going to be crucially important going forward, um, you know, over the, the coming five, ten years, I, I think is naturally going to, to help women. Um, also, continued support for enhancement and development of training and skills um, is, a, is another area which doesn't just benefit women, of course, but, but benefits um, younger, younger people involved in, in farming and men. Um, so um, I, I think that that would be uh, another aspect which would be crucially important. Um, it's also been shown in research that um, new entrants, for example, um, that uh, tend to tend to have um, quite a strong involvement of women, and that the, the partnerships in, involved in those often work in a slightly different way, in a very positive way, in terms of uh, women's involvement. Um, and of course, women are often deemed as early early adopters, particularly for environmental issues. Um, so uh, that that would be my initial thoughts on that. Sally, I think Thank you want you that. Richard. Sorry, just I think Sally wants to come in specifically on that uh, point. Sally, can I bring you in now, please? Yes. Thank you. And Richard, I think this is a, a really interesting question. And just to say, I'm currently doing some work uh, with DEFRA and with um, the Scottish Government, Women in Enterprise Scotland, and Women in Agriculture Scotland. And kind of particularly looking at the kinds of issues that may arise for women around, as Anne said, around farm diversification, because women have often taken the lead on that. And we know that diversified farm businesses are much more viable. And as Anne said, around you know, early adopters of environmental kind of schemes and so on. And similarly, we want to look at women's role in organics where it seems at a European level there is much higher involvement of women in organics than in agriculture generally, and that very much promotes the whole kind of fire to fork agenda, which is very much the direction uh, we want to go. So I think it is a really important question, and one certainly that we have our eye on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Richard, back to you. Yeah, and um, basically also ask Sarah Jane Lang her comments on that question. I thought you would, Sarah Jane. If any, I, the only thing I would add is just how important it is that any um, you know cat replacement funding adequately supports a uh, research, development, and farm advisory service because it's you know it's clear from evidence that all of those um, usually involve a, a higher proportion of, of women. Um, and encourage women to, to get involved. So I think it's, you know, as rather than looking at what might happen as a replacement to the, you know, the basic payment or, or LFAS, it's the other elements of the kind of wider cap policy that I think will have um, a major impact on increasing um, the, the role of women in agriculture. Richard. Staying with you, uh, Sarah, Sarah Jane. Um, I, and I do support women being in agriculture, and it's always impressive when you go uh, um, to different schools and see how much involvement they have in agriculture. What necessary changes to further the role of women in agriculture do you think will be the most difficult to implement? It, it, undoubtedly, culture change, um, because that's one thing that you can't, you know, you you can't introduce policy for, you can't legislate for. Then that requires a you know a change in a change in attitude and a change in behaviour, 
And, and probably um, the most important part of that is, is succession planning. And that's not really just about gender diversity. Um, you know, I can speak from my own experience from a family farm. It's very difficult to have those uncomfortable conversations about bringing other people into the farm, planning um, for, for the future. And unfortunately, the industry hasn't been great at having those difficult conversations. So that's the hardest one um, to, to progress because it involves families themselves having very difficult conversations um, and, and doing some, some succession planning um, to, to bring the next generation or the wider family into farming businesses. Anne, Anne would you like to come in on that? Anne, would you like to come in on that? Uh, yes, I would totally agree what uh, Sarah Jane said there. Um, the the other um, the other limiting factor is is also childcare in many respects and other caring responsibilities. Um, and um, you know we uh, we had a section on that in our report because we. We identified that uh, for, for many, I mean, I think there was about 54% of respondents in the 2017 research identified that childcare um, was a, a limitation on um, their progressing and fulfilling their, their role in farm businesses. Um, and, and that's a complex area, obviously, a large number of local authorities um, involved. And uh, so th that that will also take some time, and to try and come forward with some innovative approaches that um, you know can fit a, a rural situation, often isolated situations, and uh, an industry which is very much twenty four seven and doesn't stop at five o'clock. And Sally, exactly. I think Sally wants to come in as well. So, and then back to you, Richard. Sally. <coughs> And just, I mean, I think we would all agree that cultural change is the is the difficult one. And you know, Norway, a country very committed to kind of gender equality, which very quickly realised one of the reasons why there were fewer women in agriculture was their of inheritance, introduced a, a law in 1974 that made the eldest child the legal heir to the farm. So even with that legal change, I think it's about 14% of um, farmers are women. So you can see that even with legislation, it is actually cultural barriers that are the real difficulty. And this is something that I think the Scottish government are doing extremely well. They're not just trying to address this from one angle. They've got multiple prongs. they are doing unconscious gender bias to providing training with women to the equality charter. So, yeah, I think all of the task force would agree that that is the single biggest barrier. Richard. Yeah, can I thank you, Pat? Uh, can I thank you, panel? That's uh, me, uh, Kandina. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I'm now going to make an admission that I'm not going to be able to keep everyone happy by the end of the panel because I can't bring every panel member in on every question. So uh, I apologise in advance if you don't all get in. But the next lot of questions comes from Emma Harper. Emma. Thanks, convener. Good morning to everyone. Um, I'm interested in picking up what Sarah Jean said about leadership um, because um, because we've we've heard about you know there are different women already in leadership roles like Minette Batters that you've said and Kate Rowley with uh, QMS. So I'm interested to know what would you like to see continue to advance women into national and regional leadership roles within the organisations, um, and uh, are you tracking and monitoring this data in order to? encourage the early adopters into leadership positions as well. Okay, um, and Sarah Jane, do you want to head off on that? Yeah, if I can answer the second question first, because that's the easiest one and picks up what Sally said, that the task force itself um, isn't doing any monitoring evaluation. Um, the Scottish Government will be looking at progress on, on the recommendations to be able to, to answer that. In terms of what, what I'd like to see continue, some of the excellent work being done by the Women in Agricultural Scotland Network, um, the, the peer mentoring, so lots of work being done to um, encourage um, younger women to, um, you know, to be mentored by those of us already in the industry. Um, 
but also changing the way meetings are held, changing the way we do things um, as an organisation is something that you know we've seen happen uh, in the last um, two years, even more so in the last 12 months. And I think that continued move to um, improve um, diversity and be more inclusive as an industry um, through the use of online tools, um, through the use of, of training, which suits participants rather than suits the training providers, um, are two big things that I think will, will really make a, make a change. And active encouragement. Um, one of the things that we did um, as a result of the unconscious bias training pilot was to pick up on the recommendations that some of the some of the language that was used in um, our recruitment packs for board members for for chairs was maybe a little bit traditional. So we you know we had a look at that. We we made sure that um, those women who were already involved in our organisation were providing testimonials um, and and telling their story and encouraging others rather than it being a very dry um, recruitment process, which we found um, put women off applying. So. There's a few things that I'd like to see um, continue with an SLE, but also with other organisations. And um, Sally, do you want to come in, come in on that? Um... Sure. And I think you know, there's two ways of looking at this in terms of leadership. There is, you know, making sure that women are skilled and confident on the one hand to take leadership posts and are actively encouraged which is almost about their agency. And the other bit is looking at the structures and structural change. This isn't going to happen without some kind of policy intervention. Structures have not been welcoming. You know, people that I interviewed, men and women, both said, you know, that, that women would be uncomfortable, not expected at different kind of organisations. So I think we're going to have to look at some kind of structural ways of encouraging that as well. And, you know, I'm very impressed by, again, the government's, Scottish government's approach to this. The task force is co-chaired by a man and a woman, and it was gender equal and more effective for that, I think. Uh, we found it very powerful that we had senior men on the task force advocating the whole women in agriculture agenda. So I think, that, and, and that's a very simple kind of structural leadership trick that you can do. Who are you going to negotiate? How do you want that industry represented? Um, Emma, back to you. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I, I'll, I'll go on to my next question. I'm interested in the health and safety aspects as well. Um, my background is healthcare, and I've been doing, uh, um, in the last couple of years and more, a project about encouraging folk to wear helmets while they're on a quad bike, and that's whether you're a, um, a man or a woman riding a quad bike, that's a safety issue. But I'm interested in the, the issues um, that the task force came across with health and safety and uh, and what work needs to be done to continue to promote uh, activities that mean that women are better protected uh, through health and safety approaches. And that sort of goes, I think, probably to Anne to start with. Um, Anne, do you want to start on that one? Thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, I think the... There is a huge amount to be done um, in terms of health and uh, safety, um, ongoing awareness, and, and starting from quite a young age. Um, I, I think that's really important that we, we discussed about, um, for example, um, encouraging health and safety executive uh, to go into schools and and to get that to get that message of the importance of health and safety across um, at a fundamental young age. Um, there is no doubt that in the research um, it was cited that um, a number of respondents said that they were aware that um, there may be in a bid to um, in, a, in a bid to prove that they could do the job practically and physically that um, they were at times perhaps having to take risks. Um, and, um, um, you know, obviously having children on the farm, etc. cetera. Um, and, uh, and so um, it, is, it is very much an area that we need to look at. Um, Sally was actually leading on, on that area of work. Um, and 
there's been a there's been a big um, campaign through um, Yellow Wellies and other uh, other safety groups to try and highlight that really often you can only get one chance. Um, you know, that uh, we're all aware of the fatalities that can occur on, on farms um, and the lifting of heavy machinery and um, things like that, trying to encourage innovation in terms of um, materials and tools and equipment that's better suited for a variety of uh, physical, physical needs, not just women, but perhaps older, older farmers as well. Um, that uh, the, there's quite significant work can be done there. Okay, um, um, Sally, do you want to add anything to that, or we could go on to the next question? But Sally, if there's anything you'd like to add, I think it's a really, a really important question, and this wasn't actually originally part of the remit of the research. But I asked the government if we could pursue it a bit more because it came up quite a lot. And there is this perception that women are much more safety conscious on farms than men. And, you know, as um, Anne said, you know, women would talk about having this devil on their shoulder and egging them on to take the risk to show that they were able to do it just as well. There, were, there was also issues of size. I interviewed one um, five, foot, five foot two vet who, whose um, husband worked offshore. And she was uh, now work, doing full-time farm work uh, four days a week. And she talked about the importance of having the right kit. If, if crushes, if everything was the right size for her, she could operate safe, safely. So I think there is something there about equipment and about thinking of the needs of women. And as Anne said, about the needs of older farmers. And I grew up on a farm. I look back and think, you know, it's the luck of God we didn't all kill ourselves. And I think there is something about that socialisation within families where we kind of normalise risk. We don't think it out so much. So I think it's going to be an issue that's going to take us a long time to really get on top of. I'm going to let Emma in with a brief a supplementary to one panel member. Emma. Yeah, it's just a quick sup to ask if the companies that you purchase your your wellies and your, your kit from, are they making concerted effort to accommodate um, the size and shape of women in order to make a uh, kit safer? Uh, I'm not sure who wants to uh, go in on that. I'm sort of looking at all the panel members. I, I, when, when people were giving evidence, if they, looked, if they were the last person to look away, they were the one nominated. But um, Sally, you, you volunteered to come in on that one, so I'll let you back in, Sally. Okay, and again, this is something that's happened with COVID. I had hoped to do some research on this with uh, Yellow Wellies because I think we do need to look at the companies. And I think, you know, as if we want to kind of promote and advocate a changing industry going forward, then we're going to have to look at the different needs of people of different shapes and sizes. Okay, um, then we'll move on to the next question, uh, if we may, which is from Mike Rumbles. Mike. Good morning, panel. And um, we're talking about farming organisations and leadership in those farming organisations. We've been talking very much in general terms, and I want to be look at some specifics, some specific examples, for instance. Um, I do know, to correct me if I'm wrong, that the Scottish Crofting Federation are quite successful at this. They've got three out of nine board members are women. But if I use another example, the National Farmers Union of Scotland, it's my impression, correct me if I'm wrong, that it's a very much a male, um, uh, the president is male, the vice presidents are male, and it's a very male-oriented organisation, it strikes me. I mean, a number of the staff are women, of course, and, and, and they've done that. But why is it that the Scottish Crofting Federation have been successful, relatively, uh, and the National Farmers Union of Scotland have not. Uh, so I'm looking at sp these specific organisations. OK. Um, do you, if you've got any person that you'd particularly like to I know, I'd like to hear from them all, if I can. Well, OK, let's try all, all of you briefly, if I may. Uh, Sarah Jane, do you want to start on that? Um... Um, I actually think it was a question for the, the NFUS and the Crofters Federation rather than an external organisation. Um, I can tell you 
why I think that we've been a little bit more successful, and 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 that is by taking active, um, or, or by by taking actions to actively um, continue to encourage women to be involved in the organisation. But um, I'm sorry, I, I can't speak about those individual um, internal workings of NFUS or the Crofters. I suspected that, but Mike Rumbles wants to come yes, back. Yes, I, I appreciate that very political and, and adroit answer because um, you don't want to upset any organisation. I understand that entirely. But here we are trying to look at, I'm trying to get away from generalities and I'm looking at two specific, which strike me as an individual as the most obvious. There must be a reason and you must actually have a view as to why the Scottish Crofting Federation have been relatively successful and the National Farmers Union of Scotland has not been relatively successful. And I, I really don't want the other two to, <laughs> to comment upon their own views or organisations. I, I want to know from a specific... Otherwise, unless we never get anywhere, if we can't keep talking in generalities. Um, I, I tell you what, I'm going to give Sarah Jane a moment to think about the answer um, and, and go to Anne, first of all, because... Uh, I wonder if you are you a member of the NFUS? Do you have a view, Anne? Uh, yes, my farm business is a member of the NFUS. Um, and uh, over and above what Sarah Jane has, has just said, um, I think it's uh, well documented that um, there's, there's a significant proportion of women actively involved in crofting. Um, and uh, I think Sally's research touched on this, um, and uh, are are often very much at the front line of crofting, and and seem to be recognised as being at the front line of that of crofting. So um, I suspect that that uh, may be an influential factor in this. Um, I'm also aware that. Um, for for the NFUS uh, board, that um, they you know that um, that's influenced by election procedures, which stems from very much grassroots level, um, and uh, and and so again that comes back to um, tackling the awareness uh, at a grassroots level and a bottom up approach. Okay, um, Sally, do you want to come in on that? On um, Anne's point, uh, so if you look at women's position in agriculture across Europe, it's almost as if, you know, women's holdings tend to be less commercial, they're smaller, so there are a lot more women crafters, and, you know, we detail that in, in the research. So crafting their small holdings, you know, they're more accessible for women to purchase. There's more women involved. It's a different type of agriculture. It's less intensive and commercial. And, you know, for all of those reasons, there are uh, more women involved. Um, for more traditional farming organisations, there is that traditional cultural component that we've been talking about. You know, I'm Irish you know, the Irish Farmers Association following on from the task force work asked me to launch their uh, inclusion and diversity strategy because they were in a similar position and have actively started to look at the types of structural and cultural changes they may need to adopt. And I know that following on from all of this work that um, NFUS Scotland is also looking at that and are, are undertaking various strategies to see how they can be more diverse. And they are talking about it and recognising it as an issue in, in how they're structured. Colin, you want to, can, uh, Mike, Colin wants to come in with a, with a supplementary and then I'm going to go to Sarah Jane. Uh, Colin. I'm just keen to know, uh, thank you, convener, if the panel believe that, that there's a role to be played for positive discrimination when it comes to senior posts and, and organisations, political parties, for example, um, often use that when it comes to selections. And it's one of the reasons, in fact, probably the main reason why the Scottish Parliament is more gender balanced than, than Westminster. So I'm wondering if, if the panel have any views on that. I appreciate it wasn't detailed in, in the report, but um, it's certainly something that organisations can legally use. So, Sarah-Jane, um, 
Do you have any views on that or the earlier question? Sarah Jane. Yeah, so um, the, that was actually debated at length by the task force. We went back over the, um, the potential use of um, the, the stick approach of having um, you know, a requirement for a certain quota. And the task force agreed that at this time, we didn't think it was the right move. We wanted to, to try and um, facilitate change through positive um, culture change, through leadership um, opportunities, um, unconscious bias training, all of the, all of the kind of more positive um, routes to change. But in our report, we did acknowledge, um, certainly when we spoke to um, the Cabinet Secretary, we acknowledged that there might be a need to revisit this if there isn't progress um, um, on some of these um, issues. So it's something that we, we discussed, uh, we acknowledge it is a route, and it's something that the British government may want to revisit um, at a future, future date. I think back to, um, back to the, you know, Mike's original question, that I think one of the main things that has to happen to, um, to facilitate change is an acceptance that change is required. Um, and I think some organisations bought into that need to change um, sooner than others. Mike. Yes, just very briefly, and just following from Colin's point, of course, sex discrimination is, of course, illegal, and political parties have been given an exemption from that. Um, and, and there is a view that there's no such thing as positive discrimination, just discrimination. So I, I wouldn't be in favour of that, but what I would be in favour of is making every single effort to hit at this um, cultural, I think, uh, historical, traditional is the word that witnesses used there, in, in farming and the role of men and the role of women. And I just wanted to, just to make sure that we weren't just talking in the generalities, and I wanted to see what the, board, me, the members' uh, panel's view was of two particular organisations. And I think to some extent, I've got my, answer, my question answered. If I'm correct, it's basically their view is that there are more women actually involved in crofting than there are women involved in farming. And I wondered if that was actually true. Um, oh. I'm not sure who I'm going to go to to answer that question. Um, Sarah Jane, do you have a figure on 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 that? Or I mean, I noticed you all nodded uh, emphatically when uh, the word cultural change was suggested. Um, so, but does anyone want to comment on the number of women in crofting and the number of women in f farming, which are inextricably linked? Sally, I think you wanted to come in. To say that we did detail this uh, in the report. So, if you look at the number of women um, sole holders in agriculture, in farming, it's seven percent, and in crafting, it's fourteen percent. So, that that will give you a kind of a, a, a baseline to start with. Okay, I, I think that's that quite successfully answered. So, we're going to move to the deputy convener. Maureen Watt for her questions. Maureen. Thank you, Convener, and uh, good morning, panel. Um, some of us from this committee uh, were at the launch of the Women in Task Force uh, report uh, at Ingleston on the 27th of November uh, last year, and um, since then, both Emma and I have been trying to get this on the work programme for this committee, so you can see how long it has taken for it to happen here. And Fergus Ewing described um, the report as, um, for some members, it really was a journey of discovery um, for themselves being on uh, the task force here. And um, one of them, I suppose, being the co-convener Joyce Campbell, who unfortunately um, couldn't be with us today. But to follow on from some of the questions that have already been asked, and particularly um, since, you know, I can't remember whether it was a report or one of the speakers said, inequality is entrenched and embedded and simply can't be allowed to continue. If we take, for example, the unconscious bias training that you were talking about, Sarah, um, there has been, as you've said, some training, but if, following on from what Mike Grumble said, if there was a real um, willingness to see change, don't you think in some organisations they should actually be setting it up for their members, not just at a, 
a high um, officials level because we saw some definite bias uh, once it, when the report was published from them. So not just the elected officials, but actually um, from the bottom up for, at local branch level, the N, the, well, we are talking about the NFUS, should really be actively having unconscious bias training from the bottom up, because otherwise we're never going to get uh, a Manette Batters in Scotland. And I mean, nobody can take away from her that she's, you know, she was on Newsnight last night. She's on the, on the media all the time representing NFU England um, extremely well. So it's not as if we haven't, we've seen from the task force haven't got women able to do the jobs. It just seems to be there's a block. So is there any way as members of the task force that you can see that we can get that culture change embedded in what is a very important organisation? Because, you know, we have them in here in front of our committee all the time and it's officials rather than elected... It's officers rather than elected officials. OK, um, I'm going to come to Anne to start with, and then I'll go to Sally. Anne. Um, yeah, I mean, we've, uh, as we say, we're, we're just in the middle of doing the, well, just drawing towards the end of the, the pilot for the unconscious bias training, in which quite a number of uh, cooperatives in particular have taken part. Um, and uh, I think feedback from what I understand, has, has been very positive. Um, there was a big session done at uh, an SAOS uh, AGM a couple of years ago, which was very well received across the board. Um, and uh, I think it will be important to, uh, for an assessment and review to be done from that pilot. And from there, yes, to, uh, to roll that out further and to get that sort of brought down to a um, more regional level, if you like. Um, I'm aware that uh, NFUS um, have actually undertaken uh, an unconscious bias training themselves, is my understanding. Um, and uh, I think I think once that message goes out and um, a lot of farming organisations uh, out on the ground um, get involved in that and actively see the benefits, then uh, I, I do think that will that will have a significant impact um, because it's all too easy to um, when when looking for new leaders, um, new participants to to simply look at who do we know that's out there. Um, but so often um, it's partners beyond the the obvious principal farmer, if you like, um, at the farm gate, who, who may well have the skills um, that can benefit the organisation. Um, and that issue of the principal farmer, the fact that so often in the past it has just been seen as one individual, when actually nine times out of ten it's a partnership, it's a team involved in the business. Um, Sally, do you want to come in on that? Question. And if I could link it to the previous qu question, I, I think you know it's really important to uh, clarify that the Women in Agriculture Task Force, or, or the research for that matter, we're never advocating that you put position, women into positions simply to kind of obtain some balance. Rather, the, the point is, as, as this speaker has raised, is that you have plenty able and talented women who are able to fulfil these leadership positions. And what we have to look at is how we enable that to happen. And that, that's the key concern. You know, because, you know, as Anne has said, there's plenty of capability out there and we need to stop seeing Lynette Batters or Joyce Campbell as the exception. They are the exception. But there's plenty more people there who can fulfil those roles. And, you know, it is heartening that um, the task force has recommended that if we're not where we're at by 2027, 20, then we will perhaps reconsider the idea of positive discrimination or quotas. But I do also think 
that, you know, to sort of work with industry and to bring them with us is the right approach. Because in the current climate, to kind of rock up with all male delegations kind of reduces your credibility. And um, perhaps there is a role for government in saying what type of delegations they, they want to see and work with. Thank you. Uh, Maureen. Uh, thank you, and thank you for uh, those answers. When um, the Cabinet Secretary was uh, speaking at, in Parliament the, the following day in relation to the Women Agriculture Support, he talked about a number of things that were being set up, and we've talked about some of them already, like um, the Equality Charter. Um, clearly, you know, it's not up, as you said, to the task force to take this forward. So if we take the Equality Charter, for example, you know, who is taking that forward and what progress have we seen in relation to that? Sarah Jane. Yes, it's been taken forward by the Scottish Government. Um, the first phase of the pilot um, has been completed. So 10 businesses and organisations have taken part in that. Um, and it will be then reviewed and refined, um, and it will then be you know, fully tested and then mainstreamed. And we don't want there to be you know, a delay in this. The, the plan was that this would be you know, a, a short pilot. We could then tweak um, on the basis of, of that pilot, and that we then roll it out, not just for organisations, but for agricultural businesses. Because, um, as you rightly said, this has to be about change from the bottom up. So that's why the Charter for Equality isn't just about the NFUS board or the SLE board. It's about um, equality for anyone who's involved in Scottish agriculture. Thank you. And um, the, it was also announced that uh, Sheila Campbell Lloyd of Inner Workings Coaching Limited was to deliver the Be Your Best self-training pilot. Have we got any idea how that's going? Is that you as well, Sarah Jane, or...? Yeah, happy to give a, a quick update on that. Um, so the intention was to have four workshops um, held across Scotland during 2020. Unfortunately, this hasn't happened, but what they've now done is change this into an online offering, and the first of those online workshops will take place in January. And as far as I know, um, there's a huge amount of interest in that. And there'll be further, further workshops in February and uh, May and June in 2021. And then we're, the, we, the Scottish Government is just about to finalise the, the kind of longer term Be Your Best Self training programme again for delivery in 2021. So that is one of the ones which hasn't progressed um, within the timescale that the task force hoped it would have. Thank you. Um, we'll then go on to the next questions, which are from Jamie Howcrow Johnson. Jamie. Um, thank you very much, uh, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, can I? Uh, one, of, one of the first kind of uh, issues that came up was, I think, um, Anna Ray McDonald talked about um, uh, the impact on training and skills of COVID, and that while um, obviously um, th there's been a huge amount of uh, negatives, that perhaps doing more online training was actually a, a positive and provided. Um, um, you know, kind of benefits for those wanting to access in terms of timescale and logistics. So can I ask what, um, based upon uh, the kind of general skills offering, what the greatest barriers are, you think, to, to women accessing key skills? And also on the other side of that, or on the follow-up to that, what actions needed from some of the, the key educational institutions and the training bodies like LANTRA and um, uh, SRUC to ensure that the access to courses and workshops are uh, are better who'd like to start off on that um and do you feel comfortable going with that one yes thank you for the question um and uh yeah it's um it, it's it really is a um a, a huge part um for for women and their progress going forward um, I think there's a there's a number of um, limitations um, as identified in the research. Um, respondents were saying that that just availability of time. Um, I know that applies to everybody these days, but uh, particularly for for women, availability with time, often juggling caring responsibilities amongst many other things, is a critical factor. 
And of course, this then um, impacts on uh, ability to go away for, say, residential courses or for um, uh, courses that are being held some distance away, um, as well as the normal sort of trying to juggle it with the, the sort of seasonal workload of practical farming. Um, so um, other issues is that I, I think generally there's, uh, things are improving in this respect, but there's no doubt that uh, training in a, in a practical farm setting, particularly if it's like personal development training, hasn't perhaps always been uh, regarded with, with the merit it should, you know, um, and, and even perhaps ourselves, we're maybe slow to uh, put ourselves forward thinking, well, um, can we justify the time? Can we justify the cost? I would like to think that through the work of the task force and our promotion of um, our development programme, that we're actively showing that, you know, listen, this is a valuable investment, not just for yourselves personally, but for the businesses too, uh, in terms of going forward. Um, we did actually produce a a small leaflet um, for use by um, many of the um, training providers, um, just to highlight to them what we felt were some uh, basic considerations that they should be taking into account to make it easier for women to attend, timing of meetings, locations, um, just ensuring that there's suitable facilities available, things like that. Uh, and, and the likes of FAS and, and other major providers like Lantra um, are very much on board with this. Um, and uh, you can see in the women-only courses, uh, amongst others, that they've been uh, promoting over the last couple of years that uh, they're really, really looking to take this into account. Okay, um, Sally, would you would you like to come in on that, and then I'll come back to Jamie. And I know Emma's got a supplementary on this. Yeah, just to follow up on what Anne said, you know what the research found was that women felt very self conscious going to kind of continuing professional development courses when they were the only woman or one of only two women. And I think the other thing comes back to how women and her farming. So there were two distinct groups. There were the women who'd chosen to go into farming because the government had specifically asked us to look at new entrant women, and they, they were a small group. And then there were the women who, as one woman described it, fell through the trap door and found themselves in farming because they'd married a farmer. And so one of the difficulties for, for that group of women is that they're coming without the language the kind of innate knowledge of the business. So they're quite unsure of themselves. So and that adds to a feeling of subconsciousness. And as Anne said, the, um, you know, while we, the task force was meeting, uh, FOSS did um, offer some women only training programs, which were heavily subscribed. I think there were 248 women attended those. So we maybe need to think about how we access women or give them the training they need in the first instance. Another woman we interviewed said that for her, she reckoned that the problem wasn't so much the glass ceiling as the sticky floor. And I think online courses are maybe the way around that sticky floor. OK, uh, Jamie, do you want to come back on that? Uh... Yeah. Just, just very quickly, I thought it was very, very interesting, particularly what Professor Shortall said there. Um, and I kind of wondered whether the the offering of courses was wide enough, particularly for perhaps new entrants, uh, and including not only the, a, 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 range, a wide enough uh, variety of courses, but courses in things like um, some of the specifics of diversification, and also um, perhaps even around the models of farming and the ways. Um, farming can be conducted now that might might be uh, of benefit to protect, potentially uh, women coming in as new entrants. And, and Sally, just before you do that, I think Emma's question sort of melds neatly into that, if, if I've got the gist of it. So, Emma, would you like to ask yours at the same time, and I'll get Sally then to answer them both and probably bring uh, Sarah Jane in as well. Sure. Uh, thanks, convener, for letting me in with this up. Um, the NHS have 
programmes of e-learning with little modules that take 10 minutes. And some of them are to do with conflict re resolution, equality, diversity, fire safety, hazardous substances, managing chemicals, infection control. So I'm wondering if any work has been done to look at what's existing out there already that could then maybe be tailored a wee bit to support um, online learning and that kind of thing, because the NHS have done it very successfully for a while, and I know because I'm former NHS. OK, so I'll come to Sally and then to Sarah-Jane. Sally. OK, so to take the first question first about uh, new entrant um, farming, what was really interesting was this new entrant uh, group of women that were interviewed were, like, super dynamic. A lot of them were really interested in agriculture and knew they were not going to inherit the farm um, because they had a, a brother. And um, so they went into agriculture related employment. And, you know, so they were working in the industry. So they had a lot of knowledge of kind of environmental schemes, of kind of, they were very digitally skilled. And often then, you know, they met their husband, and then they have capital to rent land. And these were the kind of cutting edge, dynamic group of um, future farmers that you want. They were, they, they worked really hard. I know from some Irish research as well, that there is some suggestion that part-time farmers can also be very, very productive as well as uh, full-time large-scale farmers. So they were really innovative, really imaginative in how they were uh, approaching their business. Many of them would have said that they got their training through work, through delivering programmes or being able to develop them in that way. So I think there is a question of, it's through their other employment, they're accessing a lot of their uh, skills. I think Emma's question is an excellent one, and I do know that the Scottish government is looking, the, um, the people in recess are looking across building partnerships to maximise resources and to use the types of activities that are going on in other organisations. Again, it is, I think, probably a question for the, the, um, the civil servants, but I am aware that they are working across and uh, developing those sorts of partnerships, both around farm safety and around childcare issues and so on. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Sally. Uh, Sarah-Jane, do you want to add something to that briefly, if I may ask? Yeah, just to give a, a little bit more detail, um, there is work ongoing on a, an, a, an app for a rural training platform, because one of the things which was identified, just as um, you know, just as Emma mentioned there, was um, the, um, the need or the demand from the sector for easy access to, um, to, to online training um, tools. The Scottish Government has been working with, with Lantra, um, and they're currently speaking to training providers and end users, just to um, just to try and for the development of of that um, rural training platform app. So we're hopeful that we'll get a further um, update on that at our progress meeting in January. Thank you. Um, I think that's those questions answered. I'm just looking at the members, not seeing if they want to come back in. So I'm going to go to the next questions, which are from Colin. Colin. Thank you very much, uh, convener. Um, can I touch on an issue that, that Anne Marie uh, Macdonald. Um, referred to earlier, and, and that was um, some of the barriers faced um, as a result of caring responsibilities. The figures obviously show very clearly that um, women take on a, a far bigger proportion of childcare responsibilities uh, than men, and, and one of the, the key recommendations in the report um, is to increase access to, to childcare. Can you say a bit more about what that would look like in rural areas? What particular changes to current access um, would be required to, to support women in agriculture? Anne. Um, yeah, hugely complex area. Um, and uh, what we, the, the Scottish Government, where we were aware that the Scottish Government have, uh, have done a huge amount of work recently uh, in terms of early learning provision um, and increasing the amount of funded hours. Um, Clearly, for for rural areas and uh, women involved in practical farming, as we've said already, uh, it, the work doesn't stop at, at five o'clock. Uh, you're combining late into the night, lambing, calving, early hours. 
Um, and, and so there can be a, a difference in services between early learning care and actual child, child sitting, for want of a better word. Um, and uh, so, so what we felt was uh, the way forward was to, to really, um, we need to map out both facially uh, and, and just in terms of actual services that, that are there, quantify the services that are already existing, um, look, for, look for clear gaps and, and see what can be done in terms of marrying up uh, the providing good qualifications um, and qualified staff uh, for for those respective needs. That so, what we're saying is, it's not necessarily early learning care. Uh, it, it may well be more uh, child child sitting facilities that are required. Um, as as I'm sure most on the committee will will appreciate. Um, the reality at the moment is that there's a huge reliance on family members to step in. Um, and uh, clearly, if um, there's not older generations available or fit or of an age that they can do that, or else that um, those involved in farming may, may not be in the same locality, which is often an issue for new entrants trying to take up um, trying to take up land opportunities that become available to them, then uh, then the, the, there can be this huge gap and which becomes a significant limitation, uh, particularly for women. Um, the other issue as well on a, on a more domestic um, side, I, I guess, is just um, through, through awareness and encouragement, uh, having those conversations, sometimes difficult conversations within the home environment and, and seeing how that balance of responsibility and immediate childcare uh, can, can be worked to suit all partners. Thank you. I'm going to go to Sarah Jane and then come back to you, Colin, if I may. Uh, Sarah Jane. Yeah, just as Anne said, the main barrier here is is flexibility. Because what we were hearing from lots of people, and and you know Anne and um, you know those involved in farming businesses will know, you know if you're in the middle of a difficult lambing, if you're you know if you're on the tractor, um, we've all had that time. But suddenly you look at your watch and you realise you're late to pick up the kids from the school, um, and that flexible emergency childcare just isn't available. Um, I was able to share experience of um, a scheme I was involved in as a student in Edinburgh um, a few decades ago now. But it was called Emergency Mums and Nannies, and it was available to professional women in Edinburgh. And there was a bank of students who'd gone through training, who were, you know, who at that time were, were deemed to be, you know, safe, quality babysitters. That's what we were, and we could, you know, very quickly at, you know, sort of half an hour's notice be called on to to pick up children from school or to, to sit with them until their, their, their mums or dads finished surgery um, or, or finished work. So that kind of model um, in a rural area, we were thinking, could that work? But there are quite a few barriers. One is about the scale, which makes it a viable business, but also um, the requirements, quite rightly, to um, provide quality childcare and everything that has to be in place before someone can go into someone else's home and care for their children. So we've asked um, the Scottish Government to speak to their colleagues in early learning and childcare to look at um, that kind of service provision, as you know, because we we have the formal provision, and what we have in Scotland is is very good. But it's the it's the wraparound care and the emergency care, which um, is is really needed for for many working families, family families, not just working women. Colin. That, that's going to be obviously a, a complex issue, but, but quite clearly um, a, a massive barrier for, 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 for many women. Um, can I ask, uh, looking at other services, are there any other essential services uh, uh, where you have access barriers that are impacting on women in agriculture, in particular in rural, rural areas? Um, I'm not sure. I'm looking to see who'd like to start on that. Um, Sarah Jane, OK. You're off. Connectivity. I mean, uh, you know, it's connectivity is an access to, to good broadband remains a, a massive barrier. And we picked up earlier that, you know, the increase in remote um, meetings, remote webinars has opened up opportunities for, for women. 
and that can only happen when you have really good um, or, um, rural connectivity. Okay, does anyone else want to throw one more in on that particular area? Um, Colin, are you happy? We, we may be... I'm happy with that. You'll be pleased to know, the panel, that uh, if you look at an MSP's inbox, concerns over childcare and broadband play a huge role in that. So um, it's certainly a big challenge that we need to we need to fix. Absolutely. Thank you, Colin. Um, Peter Chapman, the next questions are for you. Peter. Thanks, uh, convener, and good morning, uh, panel. Um, basically, from the start of time, it's been the normal practice and the expectation that the son would inherit, if there is a son, would inherit the farm. And that obviously is a large barrier to women. And the task force recommends that this must be challenged and that businesses and organisations must make more comprehensive and earlier succession plans. Now, I, I know we have touched on this, Sarah Jane and touched on it earlier, but succession planning is a huge issue and it's a very difficult issue. But uh, so how how do you envision that succession norms can and should be challenged? And the, are there any policy or institutional barriers to overcoming restrictive succession practices? And I think maybe I, I would ask Anne to come in quite first on that, because she, she's obviously to some extent gone through that process, because you are a, a, a partner in the business, Anne. Um, so, you know, what's your thoughts on how we can change the, the perception that the, the son must be the, always, always be the one that inherits the farm? Anne. Thank you. I, I should probably state at the outset I don't actually have any brothers, so uh, maybe that's unfortunate. Uh, fortunate, that is. Um, but yes, it, uh, it was recognised in the research that, uh, that this is a major issue. Um, I th there's no doubt that um, as, as time has moved on and, and things have um, things have progressed. Um, I mean, um, when, when I start, first started out my career in, in agriculture, um, the, the the number of women in, involved practically, um, you know, was was a much lower figure. Whereas whereas now um, there's um, girls involved in agricultural courses, right, and saying it's, um, it's certainly near a 50-50. Um, so I, I think from the perspective of the up-and-coming generations, I'd like to think that the picture is brighter. As we've said before, I think it was Sally who mentioned, um, we did, uh, the research showed that, that this issue of succession is very much cultural and, and not a legal one. And um, it also showed that where, um, where there's discussions and, uh, you know, clear planning, um, then there's a far greater chance that, that the women will be involved. Um, and and so all the all the discussions, all the promotion and encouragement out there to to farming businesses to actively get on the front foot in terms of business planning and succession, I see as a key way forward uh, in in reaching that goal. Um, in terms of um, obviously family partnerships, it, it, it is a very sensitive issue um, but um, I, th I think with um, with training programs I'm aware that it's a, it was a subject that was discussed at a monitor farm um, meeting the other year so um, and where where these business plans are required um, then more and more I think this will be a topic that will come up you know not just from the point of view of succession but actually just resilience of the business going forward. Um, Sally I'm going to bring you in on that and then come back to you Peter. Sally. So uh, unlike Anne I have six brothers I grew up on well by Irish standards what's considered quite a large farm south of Dublin and my brothers maintain my interest in this whole question of women in agriculture is just sour grapes that I'm never going to get the part. So I think there is a big kind of cultural thing there about inheritance. And often for historical reasons, you know, land was tired, you bore arms to the king. But, you know, so it, it, it's, it's well entrenched and we reasons for it. 
And that was also true of engineering, of law, of medicine, of other occupations where this was seen as, where stereotypical presentations were seen as kind of limiting aspirations and choice of women, and where it was seen as, as not necessarily good for the industry. We know that more diverse industries are more successful. So I think, you know, there's, there's many reasons to look at how to address this. At the European level, there have been many programmes looking at how you increase the number of women entering engineering. But the transport industry is the big one at the moment. It's going to take, as Anne said, you know, multi-pronged approaches. And I think it will need to be understood as not just a, a kind of a, a gender equality issue, which it is there, but also about the future success of the, the industry. And I think uh, that importance of succession, of having those difficult discussions, and it, that's not just about gender. A lot of agricultural businesses don't have a succession plan in place. And that, that again, is really problematic for the future going forward and, and often hurts the industry. Thank you. Peter, back to you. Yeah. Um... Just to, to, to move it on a wee bit further, uh, you know, the Scottish Government uh, introduced a land matching service to, uh, uh, a year or so ago to support new entrants into farming and to identify where a, a, a farmer might want to semi-retire and allow a, a youngster to get involved in his business. And uh, uh, so that was a key opportunity for new entrants to, to get a start in, in farming. And I just wonder if, if this has had results as far as allowing more women to get a start in farming. And maybe Sarah Jane would be the, the one best to, to, to give us an idea as to whether the land matching services actually help to allow more women to, to get a foothold in the, in the farming industry. Sarah Jane. Peter, I'm, I'm afraid I don't have the, um, the up-to-date kind of progress on, on the land matching service, but, but certainly from some of the applications I saw um, early on, there, there did seem to be a, a number of, of women involved, especially in partnerships. But I think what's happening is for a lot of the, the new entrants, they're looking at different models of um, ownership or of, of tenancy. They're looking at joint ventures, and that tends to involve you know, both partners, um, if, if it's a married couple. Um, of, of different genders. So you are starting to see some more of that come through. And I think I'm right in saying that um, from research that Sally and others have been involved in, that any route like that is likely to um, increase the number of women coming forward than the kind of more traditional, um, you know, the traditional succession route. So anything which is um, put in place to encourage new entrants um, routinely results in that. But we can, we can ask for an update on the land matching service as part of our, our progress report. OK, I, d I don't know if, if either Anne or Sally wants to come back on the land matching service. Uh, I'm not seeing that either of you do. So we may move to the next question, which is from Angus MacDonald. Angus. OK, thanks, um, Camina. Just following up on, on Peter Chapman's line of questioning with regard to new entrants, um, are, are there any further policy changes that uh, need to be made to support new entrants? Who'd like to head off on that? Um, uh, Sarah Jane, you didn't look away quick enough. It's definitely you. Sarah Jane. Oh, oh thank you, convener. Um, my goodness, I, 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 I mean, I, I do think that we need to have, um, you know, a move towards a, a long-term vision for Scottish agriculture that, that isn't a barrier to, um, to new entrants. Um, we know that some new entrants at the moment, their biggest... Uh, um, issue is, is access to uh, to capital, to access to land and access to um, to support. So all of those areas have to be addressed in the replacement for um, for cap funding. So you know whilst the industry obviously welcomes some of the stability that we have at the moment, we have to um, crack on with the replacement for uh, the common agricultural policy and make sure that you know our new entrants are no longer disadvantaged. Anne, do you would, like, would you like to come in on that? Um, yes, I totally agree with uh, what Sarah Jane was saying there. And, and in addition, I, I think um, actively ensuring that, that we have appropriate uh, mentoring 
uh, support in place. And um, you know that that can uh, that can take the form of sort of uh, farmers that are retiring, um, actively supporting those just coming in, handing handing on that crucial advice and experience, which you know often you can't you can't put a value on. Um, so so things like that, I, I think, can play a, a huge important part. Um, and as we say, um, just just enabling uh, as wide a range of, of systems to be to be used as as possible, um, whether that be uh, through contract farming, land sharing, um, sharing of machinery, and uh, things like that, all all in it adding together to just make that road a little easier. Angus, would you like to come back in on that? I'm just curious if uh, uh, Sally might wish to uh, answer that one. Um, uh, certainly. I mean, as, as I said at the outset, we might not get round every panel member on, e on each of the mangas, but happy to let Sally in on that briefly and then on to your next question, Sally. Okay, sure. Um, and uh, Angus, I think it's a really important question. I just finished some research for the European Court of Auditors where they were looking at this. And at the European level, one of the issues that we identified was that the new entrance scheme isn't really broken down by gender. And it's not seen as an important route of kind of addressing gender imbalance in the industry. And I think that might be something to keep an eye on going forward. And as both um, Anne and Sarah Jane have said, there are issues about access to finance and credit. It's not just land that's really expensive. There are ways of providing funds or sharing equipment and so on going forward that, that just makes it easier to gain entry. And recognising that there are gender differences in in accessing the industry. Angus. Okay, thank you, Kenwin. That's fine, thanks. Oh, oh, thank you, thank you, Angus. Um, I just wondered if there's, uh, we have actually a few minutes in hand, if there's any members of the committee would like to ask any further questions. Um, yeah, John, you haven't asked a question. I'm very happy to bring you in. I'm gonna go to Maureen first and then come to you if there's a question you'd like to ask, John. Maureen. Convener. I mean, one of the problems in agriculture is that even where um, a woman is involved in the partnership, there's often not a salary paid. And one of the problems of not a salary not being paid is that there's then no national insurance or pen pension contributions made. And I mean, partnerships and families can break down in agriculture as well as in the, in the wider public. Is there any evidence... Um, that women are actually getting paid for the work done more than they have been in the past? Um, oh, difficult question. Who'd like to do that? Um, not seeing any volunteers. Uh, Sally, you volunteered. Yeah, I, I, it's a really good question. And I mean, it comes back to the fact that farming is, it's a family business and everybody involved is committed to the survival of the business. And, you know, often I've seen research that says that the more likely viable farm businesses going forward are ones that are, are able to rely on unpaid family labour. So I think it's, it's unusual when by members, children certainly are, are paid or they may be paid something nominal, but, it, but it's a family business. So you're right. It's a really complex, difficult question and how people's contributions to the business are resolved, you know, if, if there is divorce, is, is very messy. John, uh, John Finney, if, if, did you want a question? I, I didn't see if you nodded or not. I don't want to put you on the spot if you don't. You do, OK. Um, yeah, no, you're not putting me on the spot. Thank you very much, convener, and, and good morning, panel. Thanks. I have listened with great interest to what you've said. I just wonder very briefly, on the question of opportunities, there's been a lot of public interest, for instance, on food security issues of late, food sources of late, and with the, the climate breakdown. I wonder if there are opportunities associated with education. Do you, do you, do you think more could be done with schooling, as has happened with the STEM industries, about encouraging um, an understanding that uh, 
um, the production of food isn't about a single gender, it is about us all working together. Um, Sally, that's probably uh, you to start that one off. OK, thank you. And I'm going to have to go after this question, I afraid, I'm afraid, because I have a dental appointment. I think it's a really good question, and I think there's multiple ways in which um, we can use schools. In Northern Ireland, they've had a really successful and positive campaign talking to primary school children about farm safety and, you know, getting them to draw what they do on the farm and advising them against getting on tractors with granddad and so and so they've come at it that way i think if you look at engineering transport system that whole thing of doing kind of uh promotions with girls in um secondary school is really um important and i completely agree with you that there's a lot more that. i work in a, a in a university d department that offers agricultural degrees we have no we have no module on farm safety. So in terms of lots of, of different ways that, that this can be addressed, I think at various levels of the educational system, we can address different different types of concerns that we have going forward. So I think that's a really good point. Um, Sally, thank you very much. And before I go to Sarah Jane, and, and I know you have to uh, slip away uh, as you said, can I just thank you at this stage, uh, I will thank the others at the end for your attendance this morning. It's been very illuminating and thank you very much for finding the time. So thank you, slip away and off thank to you, you, Sarah Jane. Thanks, convener. Just to answer um, John's question here, one of the issues we found is that many people still had a very traditional view of what jobs in farming actually were. So one of the things that Lantra has worked really hard on over the last couple of years is to raise awareness of all the different um, career opportunities which exist within the wider farming sector. You mentioned you know, food and drink, food security, um, climate change, um, and it really is just about changing um, the next generation's idea of what being a farmer is, is all about, because so many of them um, still have a very traditional uh, view that you know, all you do is either drive a tractor or, or work with, with the sheep and beef. And that's fantastic, and it is a key part, but there's so much more to, to modern agriculture um, than that traditional view. And that's where um, Lantra is, um, has, has a role to play, as does the industry. So, you know, partnerships with um, through, um, RET, um, through um, some of the work that's been done with um, the um, other organisations, to get into schools and explain the realities of, of farming and show that it's a valued career um, and a career choice that, that more should consider. Th thank you for that. Anne, do you want to, to add anything to that? Thank you. Yeah, excellent, excellent question. Um, there's no doubt that in, in times gone by, I think it's fair to say that there was a lot greater connection um, bet for children living in rural environment, going to rural schools, than, than probably what there is now, and unless their families are directly involved. Um, and, and so I, I think there's a huge amount to be gained by making that connection again, um, and not just in terms of girls and sort of, um, as Sarah Jane has said, kind of sh demonstrating clearly the career opportunities that are out there. But just in terms of encouraging local food, um, good quality food, which then impacts onto health and to diet, um, mental and physical well-being. So I think there's a massive gain in there. Um, Sarah Jane mentioned about the, the huge range and expanse of career opportunities all associated with agriculture now. Um, and top of the list has got to be IT. You know, we've got drones, we've got GPS, um, all being kind of used at a practical farm level. Uh, and, um, and so there's, there's a huge awareness exercise to be done in there. Clearly, the likes of the young farmers uh, do a massive amount in this regard, as, as well as RET that um, Sarah James mentioned. Um, but, but they tend to come on at a slightly older age group. I think getting those messages across at primary school, uh, I think, can pay huge dividends because that's where that's where the interest starts. So thank you for that. Thank you, Anne. Okay, uh, thank you very much. <clears throat>
John, is that you finished? Or? I just wanted to thank the uh, participants for, for their answers and for, for all their work. Thank you. Uh, OK. Uh, there's a brief final question from Emma Harper. Emma. Well, not uh, final, penultimate, actually. Uh, okay. Emma. Thanks, convener. It's just to pick up on uh, what Sarah Jane said about uh, the Royal Highland Education Trust. I know there's been great work done by Fiona Jimison for the Dumfries and Galloway RET, where they've got kids from school onto the Crichton campus SRUC, but also to the Auction Martin Castle Douglas. So it was just to expand on, like, do, does more support need to be provided for RET in a wider Scottish approach so that kids get more access to what uh, farming and agriculture is all about. Sarah Jane, do you want to head off on that? Yeah, I would always advocate more support for RET. I think the, you know, the organisation is fantastic. Um, and as Anne said, they're trying to get to more and more um, children in Scotland. And many of the, um, the regional RETs have, have been offering online and virtual um, offerings so that that connection hasn't been entirely lost during COVID. So, you know, as an organisation, it's, um, you know, it punches well above its weight. And, um, yeah, I would certainly um, advocate um, more support and, and more funding for, for it as an organisation. Anne, do you want to add anything to that? Um, nothing further than I think uh, Sarah Jane has, has fully covered, and I would totally endorse that. Okay, brilliant. Um, so, if I may, uh, I, I get the last uh, question here. It's really just to clarify, if you could succinctly tell me what you think the next steps should be. Um, uh, so an easy question to answer and no doubt a short answer, neither of which is true. So Sarah Jane, head off. I think that the, um, the charter has to happen, convener. We have to roll that out because without that, um, you know, the charter principles have to be embedded in every organisation and every business in agriculture. So that's the one that I'd really like to see happen um, sooner rather than later. OK. And Anne? Yes, I think we need to um, really push on growing awareness um, of, of the issue. And bottom line is that um, fully involving all partners um, and, and women in the industry is not a luxury. It's a fundamental going forward. If this industry is to survive the many challenges that it is facing going forward, uh, Brexit, climate change, among many others, um, then you have to have everybody on board and you have to fully utilise the skills that are out there and available. And that probably is, is a good point to leave it. And, and I totally endorse uh, everything that you say there. I think that's entirely right. And the committee will look to monitor um, the Women in Agriculture recommendations as it engages with the Scottish Government and agricultural stakeholders as we do on an ongoing basis. Uh, probably suffice to say this, as the Deputy Convener pointed out, has been a long-awaited session. It didn't disappoint when we got there. Thank you very much, Sarah Jane, Anne, and also Sally, who's no longer with us, uh, because you had to go to a meeting, for your attendance today and the evidence that you gave us. It's been really worthwhile and very illuminating. So thank you. And I'm now uh, going to uh, uh, move the meeting into private session, but I am going to suspend the meeting for five minutes uh, and then move into private session uh, then. So thank you very much, panel members, for your time this morning and your contributions. <laughs>